Good morning, everyone. Great turnout uh, for uh, early in the morning, so thank you all for coming, and thank you for attending this conference. Uh, your attendance and the participation that we're seeing here and the registration numbers conveys the importance of this conversation, and it also conveys your commitment to helping the University of Montana provide the best educational experience possible in today's world. I want to give a special welcome to our visitors who are here from other places today, and you'll meet some of those who are on the program, but I know there are many in the audience that are here from other places as well, and so a special thank you to all of you who traveled uh, from uh, other places this morning to get here and be a part of this conference. So delighted to have you here. This conference had its genesis last spring at a meeting of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. A group of us from UM were attending that conference and we were inspired by the ideas that we were hearing from the speakers and the conversation and the discussion that went on at that conference. At one of the evening receptions, we were talking around the table about the efforts we have in place here at UM, but also what we need to do better uh, at UM and think about the future. We agreed that an in-depth discussion focused exactly on what we do here at UM was crucial to our future. A planning committee got started last spring, and today's conference is the result of their hard work. So I'd like to give my deep thanks to the members of that planning committee, uh, co-chaired by Nathan Lindsay and Rebecca Power. So if I could, those of you from the committee who are here, would you just uh, stand, please, and let us thank you for your work? The title for this conference may be a little long, but every word in the title is important, and the organizers crafted that title carefully. Defining a 21st century education for a vibrant democracy. The first word in that title, defining, means something. This is intended to be an action-oriented conference in which we will dream big and envision many advanced and innovative educational opportunities and approaches. We'll develop specific strategies through our panel discussions and breakout sessions inspired by the keynote speakers that we hear. Also, we want to think deeply about how we actually implement those ideas as well. It's critical that we have the input of everybody here, faculty, staff, students, members of the community, members of the administration. So I encourage you and, in fact, implore you to engage actively and constructively in the conference uh, throughout the next day and a half. The second set of words, 21st century, has very important meaning too. This is not a conference about preserving the past for its own sake. This is a conference about thinking where education needs to go in the future in the 21st century. So I want us to think creatively, think in a forward-looking way about what we do here and making sure that we take the best of everything we offer at the University of Montana, combine with new ideas, and offer the most dynamic and effective and outcomes-oriented education that we possibly can. The conference title refers to a vibrant democracy, so important to this institution, but to our state and to our nation. What is higher education's role and responsibility in a vibrant democracy? The conference uh, subtitles, the, the sessions throughout the next day and a half, get at those essential components of a vibrant democracy through education. For example, prosperity through a productive workforce. At UM, we do that through a wide range of programming, and I believe it's essential that we don't lapse into this false dichotomy of a workforce-oriented education versus uh, a leadership or a liberal arts-based education. That we, we don't do one or the other. That's not the point. True, much of our programming is quite directed towards specific careers or professions. Programs like pharmacy, communicative sciences and disorders, nursing, journalism, to name just a few. But at the heart of all of our programming 
are the ideals of a 21st century education. Critical thinking, communications, problem solving, a broad knowledge base. Those concepts are realized in academic programs across the university, and those attributes are simply outstanding preparation for a quality life in today's world. You will find uh, that many of our liberal arts and sciences graduates, for example, are leading some of the country's biggest companies. They are policy makers, our lawyers, our physicians, our entertainers, our writers. Our responsibility in, uh, for a vibrant democracy includes educating the next generation of leaders. So a major portion of this conference will focus on leadership development. Leadership in the context of a connected world in which problems and opportunities transcend political and geographic boundaries. Our responsibility to a vibrant democracy includes nurturing our students to become engaged citizens, members of their respective communities who stay informed, who advocate for what they believe to be the best interest of their communities, and who give of their talents and energy in improving our state, our nation, and our world. This conference will also focus on how we deliver such an education. What are the most effective vehicles for bringing a UM education to all of our students, whether they are traditional high school graduates or members of the increasingly diverse set of learners that we have at the university and throughout higher education. We'll also have a session during the course of this conference on the Academic Alignment and Innovation Program, an exercise conducted by our faculty, deans, and provosts this past year to look at our portfolio of academic programming in total at the university. Well, I want to acknowledge that in so many ways, we are already providing an innovative 21st century education at the University of Montana. And I'm impressed by the astounding, the outstanding work of faculty and staff on our campus to provide life-changing learning environments uh, uh, for all of our students. So you might ask, well, why are we having this conference? Why aren't we meeting on our biggest challenge, enrollment? Well, we are. This is at the heart of uh, making el uh, an education that is attractive, interesting, relevant, and outcomes-based for our students. As we define uh, an education for the 21st century, that will be an education that is attractive to students, uh, and it is at the very heart of, uh, of our enrollment. Well, we have several tremendous keynote speakers uh, for this conference to give us provocative ideas and to get us started down the road of this conversation. These are folks who represent national level thinking on the state of higher education in today's world. In a few moments, you'll hear from Deborah Humphreys, who is the Vice President for Policy and Public Engagement from the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Later on, you'll hear from Patty McGill-Peterson, who is the Presidential Advisor for Global Initiatives at the American Council on Education. Tomorrow morning, uh, we have a very special speaker, the Secretary of Labor of the United States, Thomas Perez. The keynote speakers and the panel discussions will be recorded, and we'll have note takers for each of the breakout sessions, so you can review the discussions and action steps that were outlined at this conference in the coming days. Again, this is intended to be an ongoing conversation, so ideas from this conference will be, will be discussed in more detail at future open forums and university meetings. Again, thank you all for coming today, and I look forward to a wonderful, uh, wonderfully provocative couple of days of conversation here. At this point, I'm pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker, Deborah Humphreys, again, of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Dr. Humphreys holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Williams College and a PhD in English from Rutgers University. We have somebody else from Rutgers sitting in the front row here, second row here. At AACNU, she serves at, Deborah serves as the Vice President for Policy and Public Engagement. In this role, she leads AACNU's national and state level advocacy and policy efforts related to issues of student success and the quality of student learning in higher education. As part of AACNU's Liberal Education and America's Promise, or LEAP, initiative, she's helping to build communications capacity on the part of college and university leaders and faculty members and to educate the public about the value 
of an engaged education to prepare for the changing global economy. Dr. Humphreys also leads the policy strand of AACNU's Lumina Foundation supported initiative, Quality Collaboratives, working in nine states to advance transfer and assessment policies that better account for students' demonstrated accomplishments of learning. Dr. Humphrey oversees all of AACNU's policy, public and employer engagement and outreach, media relations, and the development of all AACNU's publications, which you've, if you haven't seen them, they are among the highest quality publications in higher education out there. Dr. Humphreys regularly serves as AACNU's official spokesperson, and in that role she has appeared on Fox News, NBC Nightly News, the PBS program To the Contrary, and has op-eds published in USA Today and, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. She speaks widely to educators, business leaders, and policymakers about quality issues in higher education and about the importance of, a liberal, of liberal education in, in today's higher education and its importance to the future of America's economic health and democratic vitality. She also serves often as communications and educational consultant to colleges and universities with a special interest in board communications, internal campus communications, including communicating with students, faculty, and in the area of curriculum development. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Deborah, Deborah Humphreys to the University of Montana. Deborah. Thank you so much, President uh, Engstrom, and I want to say a special thank you to Nathan and Rebecca and the team for putting together such a wonderful um, array of <laughs> topics and speakers and issues that are, are so on target for where we all need to, to be concerned to make sure that not only the University of Montana but all of American higher education continues to provide to today's students what they need uh, for the future and to help build our vibrant democracy and, and also a vibrant economy as well. Um, my remarks are definitely going to echo uh, some of the themes that President Engstrom uh, already put on the table, and I too was really impressed with the care with which this program was put together and the care with which the title was chosen. I, I also liked very much several aspects of that. Um, I spent a lot of my time trying to help higher education very clearly define what it is doing and what it is accomplishing for students because increasingly um, from where I sit, we're f quite frustrated sometimes with how those outside of the academy do or often don't understand what we're all about, what we're trying to do, and what we are really accomplishing uh, for our students. So the definitional part of this is pretty important. Uh, getting it right, obviously, so that you can deliver on what you, what you are trying to do for your students internally is important. But the way in which you can define what your mission is and what your curricular programs are all about also helps uh, Royce and me and lots of other people describe you to the outside world and build the kind of capacity that, that we need to have to help build the support for the work that you're doing. So I'm going to talk today um, about this question of using higher education to foster an engaged citizenry as well as professional success for students. And I want to stress something that um, President Engstrom mentioned as well, that I want to really resist and work very hard against what I think is a very false dichotomy that many people outside the academy have, thinking that we have a choice that is either preparing students for workplace success or preparing them with a good, solid liberal education to enable them to be responsible citizens of a democracy and of the broader global community. And I'm going to argue very strongly that that's not an either or choice, that what we are all about in higher education is a both and picture, and a both and picture in a couple of different ways. Um, so I'll be stressing that throughout my presentation. And I think I need to turn this on, maybe. Okay, I'm just going to go like this because that makes it just as easy. So um, 
Dr. Engstrom pointed out that uh, AACNU has been running for about 10 years an initiative called Liberal Education in America's Promise. Uh, and President Engstrom and, and other active member presidents at AACNU provide the intellectual heft for this project and have helped shape it. So thank you very much for that. And LEAP is an interesting initiative. It's a little bit different than other ones that ASCNU has done in two ways. It really is an initiative we conceive of as a collaboration, not only with educators, not only with our, our members, but also with students, with parents, with business leaders, with policymakers, with people who are on the outside of higher education, with whom we have to both communicate better and partner in order to build that vibrant democracy and vibrant higher education system. So what is LEAP? Um, it's a multi-project initiative. There are lots of moving parts to it. But basically, it is an initiative that is championing, championing this both-and vision of preparing students with an engaged, globally aware liberal education that can help them become the socially responsible citizens we need and can flourish in a, a vibrant, and challenging global economy. And I want to say right up front, again echoing what your president mentioned, we see liberal education, and we use that term in a very broad and capacious way. So we don't only mean the liberal arts and sciences, though the liberal arts and sciences are part of any good liberal education. We believe that you can and are educating liberally educated professionals in a variety of fields. You can become a liberally educated nurse. You can become a liberally educated engineer. And I will argue if you become one of those, you are actually going to be more competitive in the economy. And I'll, I'll make the case for that in a moment. Many people outside of higher education, however, don't always, uh, when they hear the term liberal education, don't always think of this definition. But this is what we mean by it, and this is something that AAC and you needs your help with to help the public understand that this is what a forward-thinking 21st century liberal education is all about. It's about what it equips our, our graduates to be able to do in the world and how they can function in the world in better ways because of the education we're providing to them. So the LEAP initiative was launched in 2005 and we did a lot of economic research. We did surveys with students, with recent graduates, with employers. We talked to a lot of people outside of higher education as well as all of our members. And we issued a report in 2007 called College Learning for the New Global Century. And this is just one quote from a much longer report. But basically, it, it captures in a tight little way the world that we're really preparing students for, which is one that is characterized by interdependence and by disruption. And really, the LEAP initiative asks two big questions. What are the learning outcomes that are most important to prepare students for success in this kind of world? Not just learning outcomes that are nice, but that are essential. What are the essential things that every single curricular program has to build in students for success in this kind of world? And then also, um, what are the educational practices that will actually get students to those outcomes? So for about 10 years, we've been working on this. We have been looking to our members for how we're reinventing the 21st Century Academy to do this. You all are doing that. And then AACNU is trying to put a mirror up to our best practices to look at them and then say, right, how can we scale this up and ensure that all students are getting the best of what we have to offer? So I mentioned that the LEAP vision is a both-and vision. Um, it is one that builds on the enduring values and the things that have made higher education in America great. And one of the things that has made it great is that we have always in America seen education as a critic, playing a critical role in building democratic capacity. And higher education plays a role in that as well. And it continues to need to play a role in that. Now, I've gone all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. You could go to, I'm sure that there are historians and political scientists in the room who could feed to me other quotes from our founding fathers and mothers. And, and you can look at a lot of critical moments in the history of, of America, GI Bill, uh, World War II, um, 
that's coming out of the Civil War. There are many moments in our history where we have stepped back and said, whoa, we need an educational system that can help us continue to have that vibrant economy. And you can look all throughout the, the history of, of the United States and see us turning to education for this. And I would argue we have to continue to, to think about that. That is part of our mission. It's not our only mission, but it's an incredibly important part of our mission. And I think one of the moments, we're in one of those moments right now, and it's a, it's a moment where I think the stakes are particularly high in terms of how we as educators talk about, think about, define what we're doing. Um, and I think we're actually at a moment of potentially a kind of narrowing a vision that is quite dangerous. Now, I'm picking on President Obama. Uh, I could have picked on, this is a bipartisan problem, so I could have picked on other policymakers who are talking about education and what the challenges are in, in America right now. So it's not a Democratic versus a Republican issue. But there is an awful lot of discussion uh, in this way about how education is really uh, is and must be about getting students into the workplace quickly uh, and getting them into gainful employment. And I'm not opposed to gainful employment. I have a job. I'm extremely happy about the fact that my education positioned me for, for gainful employment. Um, it's important. It's an important part of what we do. Helping students successfully make that transition from college to career is incredibly important. But it's not all we do. And this vision, I think, I am concerned, is sometimes narrowing down our focus too much. And ironically, that narrowing of focus may ultimately be hurting our students in the long-term journey they're on toward professional success. And I'll explain what I mean around that. But in terms of this both-end vision, let's talk a little bit about building democratic capacities. Because we do need to remind ourselves and remind the public at large that the skills that are required to build a vibrant democracy are ones that are learned and have to continue to be rejuvenated and learned in every generation. Benjamin Barber said it well that I added the term, the, the phrase and knowledge in here because I think that we need both skills and knowledge and there are things that are acquired and that higher education has a role to play in that, and general education in particular has a role to play in that. And I'm going to talk throughout my talk about specifically how this vision gets translated, particularly in terms of our general education curricula. So I think we have to ask some really tough questions, and you are going to be asking and answering some tough questions all day today and tomorrow about how the University of Montana enables and builds students' capacity both for citizenship and for professional success. And that means asking questions about the skill base that you're developing as well as the knowledge that is needed. And that's very challenging right now because we are in a world of a knowledge explosion Knowledge is everywhere. Our students think they can find the answer to any question they need in their pockets, right? So how we teach them knowledge and how we teach them how to use knowledge, which really is the name of the game now, is incredibly important. But if we're thinking about the global economy and democratic vitality in a globally interconnected society, Patty's going to talk about that some more later today, you can ask questions like this question. You know, how do we, how do we really compare, prepare students to be responsible citizens in a globally interconnected democracy unless they have real knowledge about world history, about religion, about all kinds of things that are tried and true elements of the liberal arts, but need to be placed in a broader context for our students to really get the most out of um, their understanding of these areas of knowledge. And because of that knowledge explosion, I want to challenge you to think about the curricular pathways that you're creating for students through general education and in their majors, and to think about how you organize that knowledge acquisition for students. It is no longer the case, I'm not sure it ever was, but it's certainly no longer the case now that we can write down all the books that an educated person needs to have read and all the knowledge that an educated person needs and we can just ensure that, that our students have it and they walk out the door and that's it. They have everything they need. Clearly knowledge uh, creation, knowledge use is, is moving way too quickly for us to do that. 
So the question is, how do we organize knowledge in the curriculum? And one way that I want to suggest we might consider is organizing it around the big questions of our time, the big questions that a vibrant democracy is challenged to deal with. And we have a lot of those big questions at home, and we have a lot of them abroad. Um, Patty can talk a little bit about the global environment we're in this afternoon, and a lot of that global environment requires people to think about how knowledge is used to solve big issues. So can we really do both? Um, Angstrom and I both believe we can, that a both-end vision is what makes a university great, but really can we do both? Can we prepare students for success in the economy and to be globally aware democratic citizens who are socially responsible? I would say yes, absolutely we can, because the outcomes, the skills, the capacities that are important for one are, turn out to actually be the ones that are important for the other. So that's the good news. The bad news is that we are not fully organized in our institutions to actually align the outcomes that we're, we need with the actual curricular pathways we have. We have the ingredients, I'm going to suggest, but we aren't fully aligned yet. <laughs> so I want to start with how I make this argument that, in fact, the outcomes are the same. So one of the things that we've been doing in the LEAP initiative is we've been looking really hard at what are the big economic trends, what is the big economic picture that we need to understand in order to prepare students well. And so we've been influenced by a number of economists, uh, including Frank Levy and Richard Murnane. Other economists have also come to the same conclusion they have, but this paper they wrote uh, two years ago called Dancing with Robots, I recommend highly. Um, it has to do with the impact of both globalization and technology technology on the work that human beings now will be doing in, in the current economy and, and moving forward. Uh, you can find this entire paper and all of the research behind it online, so I encourage you to, to Google it. And what you can see in this quote from the paper is their analysis is that as technology has, has influenced the economy, there are two main things that are important for the work that's left that humans can do that machines can't do. And those involve two big things. One is working with new information. So notice how that is phrased here. So it's not just having knowledge, right? It's knowing how to attain knowledge, use knowledge, communicate knowledge in certain settings. New information. Information is constantly changing, and we need to help students be able to work with new information. And then we also need to help people be able to solve problems for which you cannot write standard operating procedures. So if you think about the kinds of jobs that are in the economy, basically the kind of job that my working class dad had is one that likely is being done by a machine now. Pretty much anything that you can write standard operating procedures to solve a problem, if it isn't already being done by a machine or a computer, it will be soon. <laughs> now, what some people conclude from this kind of economic research is that there will be no jobs left at all, <laughs> right? These economists and a lot of others say, no, maybe not, if you look at how other periods of technology has changed. In fact, what's happening is it's the jobs that are left, the jobs that need to be done, require higher levels of learning, which is why, in fact, higher education is becoming more and more important in our society, not less. We need people who can actually invent the technology to actually do these kinds of tasks. We need people who can manage that technology, who can leverage the technology to enable a company, for instance, to add value. So one of the things they did was, in this uh, study, they took all of the jobs in the economy and they carved them up into five big chunks based on the, the predominant area of skill that's required. And then they tried to chart, these aren't the raw numbers of these jobs, this is the growth rates from 1960 through 2009. <laughs> and you'll see that the, the jobs that are growing the fastest are those jobs that require working with new information, solving unstructured problems. The ones where the growth rates, they're still in the economy. It's not that they're disappearing completely, but they're not growing as fast. Are those jobs that require routine manual skills, routine cognitive skills, um, and non-routine non-routine manual skills. So if you think for that third category, um, 
we're staying at a hotel, the person who's currently cleaning my room, that's a sort of non-routine manual skill. We still have those jobs in our economy. We're going to continue to have them. But they're not growing the way the other jobs are growing. And the truth is that the University of Montana is educating people for those jobs, the ones that are growing. So the other thing that we've done in the LEAP initiative is we've talked to employers. Uh, we've asked a lot of questions. We've done focus groups, and we've done five national surveys over the last 10 years, asking them about recent college graduates. Who are you hiring? What are you hiring for? What are you getting? What are you not getting? What do you wish we would do more of? Uh, how can we really prepare people to hit the ground running and be successful in this economy? I'm going to just share a few findings you have in front of you um, handouts to give you some of the data and we can I can answer specific questions about the data because I'm going to go pretty quickly through some of it but all of the data from all of our surveys including slide decks and and summaries are up on the website at this place and I recommend and encourage you to download and use them in whatever settings you are uh, where you're talking to students or parents or anyone else that's what they're designed to do so the first big takeaway, and this has been true across a lot of these surveys we've done, we've asked this question a lot of different ways and, and multiple times, uh, we've asked the question not just uh, how, if you're talking to a student and they're asking, well, how do I get that first job, there's one set of answers. But of course, what we really want is to prepare students for the long term, to not just get the first job, but to be positioned to be promoted over time. Right? So that's how we asked this question. We said, well, what's more important? Is it the very specific skills in a field? It is, is it breadth that cuts across all fields, or is it both? And here, clearly, it's both and. Uh, about 60% say that we want students to have both field-specific knowledge as well as breadth. That general education in the major uh, concept that we have is still a, a pretty decent way of thinking about it. The other thing I'll say about this finding is that we've asked this question a few times over the last 10 years, and that, that yellow piece of the pie, the narrow training part, has gotten smaller in that period of time, and the blue and the green have both gotten slightly bigger. So if anything, the economy, through the recession and coming out of it, the breadth of knowledge and skills has become more important, not less important. The other thing that we learned when we talked to employers is that they, too, are thinking both and. They do want broad learning. They want especially cross-cultural capacities, which will help also with the global uh, agenda that um, Patty will talk about later. And they want more hands-on learning. So this set of questions we asked, um, we asked it in an agree-disagree sort of way. And so when you do that, you, you, those of you who are public opinion people um, know this. When you ask this kind of question, you elicit two, two kinds of things. One. You can elicit where there's real agreement, and you kind of have a clustering of real agreement around the breadth questions we're asking here. So they do want hands-on learning, they want training, but they do believe that college should be preparing students with civic learning and civic knowledge. That's something they agree with. The other thing that, that you see when you ask questions like this is sometimes something will jump out as particularly strong. And when you have very high numbers of people strongly agreeing, so if you look at this, the dark bar is the strongly agree part, you see one thing that jumps out as clearly intense. And that is they believe very strongly that every single college student should have experience solving problems with people whose views are different from their own. Diversity is really important in a broad sense, not just some of the ways in which we think about diversity, but in all of the ways you might think about diversity. And solving problems with people who have views that are different than your own has to be a part of every student's education. The other thing that we have investigated are these things we call essential learning outcomes. You have those in, in, in your handout as well. Those are the things that we have been working with in the LEAP initiative for quite a long time. And we've asked employers about them in a variety of different ways. You have the full findings of what they said about the, uh, the essential learning outcomes on this handout. And what I'm sharing on this slide are just the ones that rise to the top of the list as the ones that they rank as most important for success in today's workplace. And you'll see a lot of these things are, in fact, the, the kinds of outcomes, the kinds of skills and capacities you need, both in an innovation-driven economy and to be responsible citizens in a democracy. 
A um, couple things, nothing will really surprise you on this list, I would, I would assume. But not only do they want people who can think critically and solve problems, but they also want people with ethical decision making capacities. And they want them to have real world experience. So those are some of the key ingredients that you want to think about as you're constructing curricular pathways. So how do we do this? Like I said, I think there's, some, there's good news and bad news in all of this national data. Um, and some of the good news is that even though the media doesn't pay much attention to it, and, and it's very frustrating because people outside of the academy are constantly saying that, oh, higher education is totally uninnovative. They don't change at all. That's completely untrue. We, we all know that there's enormous innovation going on on college campuses. We are really reinventing a 21st century education. Um, but we're doing it internally, and we're doing it often in pockets of innovation that aren't always integrated and connected. So AACNU has looked at our members and has looked at a lot of educational research, and we have seen that you have all kinds of practices that are building these capacities. And these are all practices that there's a robust body of research behind that shows that they work. They keep students in school, they increase graduation rates, and they improve the outcomes that we most want. The problem is not all students are getting all of them. We have them. We often offer, I'm sure, that probably everything on this list is available at the University of, of Montana. But the question is, can you get through the University of Montana and avoid some of these practices or all of these practices, right? Because a lot of these practices, the reason they work they require engagement and time on task. They force students to actually do the problem solving and the inquiry, not just sit back and receive information. And because of that, they are sometimes harder. Um, they're more challenging. And so therefore, students often avoid them. Mm -hmm. Or only some students raise their hand, right? We all know there's a group of students who really get it, who want to sort of wring every possible experience out of their education and will raise their hand and will be involved in every single one of these things and many more. But there are a lot of students who either don't know that these are the kinds of things that will build those capacities for success or are just avoiding them because they're trying to find the path of least resistance. So that is really our curricular challenge. How do we build into every curricular pathway we have? Not that there's only going to be one, right? We know there are going to be multiple. How do we build those engaged experiences for all students? How do we ensure all students get it? We also did ask the employers this question. Um, and this can be used if you're trying to make the case for one of these practices, if you're one of the people who's doing them. So we asked employers, it, we asked the question in this way. We said, well, if you were looking at a candidate who had one of these experiences, and these are the ones we tested, um, would you be more likely to hire them? And there are some interesting things that, that come out in this data as well. Clearly, internships comes out on the top. I think that's mostly because employers understand what those are and really feel like, oh, right, that's going to get at the real world experience piece. I got that. But look at what's num the second there, which is really about the kind of senior research project that a place like University of Montana can do so, so well because you are a top flight research university. You have the capacity to get students engaged in real research and evidence-based reasoning. We did a, this is the 2015 survey. We did another one in 2013 where we asked a lot of other questions about high impact practices. And I wanted to share some, some findings from that one as well because I think they're really important for the unique uh, advantage that you have as a research university for undergraduates, not just for graduates. And that is that 83%, we tested I think about seven or eight of the high impact practices in 2013, and the one that came out on top was basically research, undergraduate research. Having students, I think it was 83% endorsed actually requiring all students to do top level research in their field to demonstrate that they had evidence-based reasoning skills. So it seems to me that even though we sometimes use language that's different from what employers use, they want people who can use evidence to solve problems. They want people who can understand evidence-based reasoning. And you know what? That's what research universities do. <laughs> it's right at the core of your mission uh, is evidence-based reasoning. You'll see there's lots of other things on the list that have more or less intense, but all a majority would say, if you have this experience, you're more likely to get hired. 
So what does all this mean for how we organize our curriculum? Well, one of the things I want to talk about is integration. Because we do still organize that, that question of whether we're aligned to prepare these outcomes. We do organize our educational system in little tiny boxes and silos. We all know that. We're all struggling to try to open the doors and windows of our departments and our divisions and our schools and our student affairs and our academic affairs. We're all struggling to do that. Um, but the stakes are particularly high if we are, in fact, going to educate students who can build a vibrant democracy and succeed. Because, as Gandhi points out, th these are Gandhi's seven deadly sins, and I think some of them, particularly the ones that I've underlined, are really important for us to avoid as well in our curriculum, right? We, we cannot and shouldn't be teaching science without humanity, knowledge without character, um, politics without principle, or commerce without morality. That's why we need institutions that, ha that bring together the professional fields as well as the arts and sciences and build these capacities in an integrated sort of way. So how do we do this? Well, I think that I'm going to say a couple things about general education, and then I'm going to wrap up and we can ask some questions. But I want to say that uh, it's very important that we not place all of the responsibility for all of this on general education. It has to be an integrated vision, and general education can't do everything. There's only so many credits we have in general education. Um, and they have to lead in a seamless sort of way into building these capacities at higher levels in majors. So I have about five different things that I think are really important to think about in general education in particular. We have to prioritize integration and application. We can't only reserve the application part for the majors, right? We need to build that into general education as well. And I'm using the term application in a broad sense, so I don't just mean an internship. I mean using knowledge in the world. <laughs> solving problems in a community-based research experience or service learning experience, or in the classroom, learning knowledge, but learning it in a, in a real, real-world context of problem solving. We need to look at those high-impact practices and figure out how we can embed them in the curricular pathways that students take. Some of those high-impact practices were invented in general education, but not all of them. And some of them can be really integrated, and I'll give you some examples in a minute. We also need to really integrate the curriculum, the co-curriculum, and also what students are doing in their working lives. A lot of your students have work-study jobs or have jobs outside of the, the university, and I don't think we're exploiting enough those opportunities. Those are learning experiences. They're already putting the things that you're teaching them to use in those settings. Are we giving them an opportunity to reflect on that? Can they talk about how their own experience in education is related to the success that they are already having in the workplace. It's just an underexploited thing that your students are already doing. I also think that we have divided up admissions advising, career advising, academic advising, co-curricular activities, again, into silos. And in fact, students need all of that to be much more integrated, right? Their own career advising has to do with their academic pathway and how they are exploring what their own skills are and their strengths and their interests are through the curriculum, not separate from it. And that we need to do a lot more work on. We do need more problem-based and applied learning. And finally, we need to help students. You're spending today, right, defining in more clear terms what a University of Montana education is all about and how you're delivering on it. Students themselves need practice and rehearsal of talking about what they know and can do. They go out on the job market, we give them a transcript which doesn't tell much of anything in terms of what they know and can do, and then we, they get out there and they don't know how to talk about that great study abroad experience they had, or that community-based research project that they did, or that student learning uh, leadership opportunity that they had. They don't even know that those things are relevant to their job hunt. But of course, they're highly relevant. They are the real world demonstration that they are able to do the things that employers want them to do. So that's really, that's actually not a heavy lift, but it is a conversation that faculty, advisors, everyone needs to be having with students more than just once um, on, on repeated occasions. And then finally, I'm going to skip over that. I want to share with you a couple of examples. So 
AZNU has 1,350 members, uh, we, so I could have, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples of how uh, colleges and universities, I'm sure there's probably hundreds on this campus that I don't even know about, that are doing all the things I just talked about. Um, these are just some examples in general education, uh, different kinds of schools from Worcester Polytech, which is an engineering school that has organized its entire general education program about big, solving big engineering challenges and problems, often in global settings. So they take their students and they send them off to Thailand to actually do an engineering project. And the students are prepared to do that through a general education program that's very international, that's giving them cultural context, cross-cultural communication skills, all those things that general education provides, while also building those engineering skills so that when they're on that engineering project, they're actually solving a problem that a community really needs to have. Uh, Wagner College actually reorganized their entire general education program around learning communities with writing intensive courses embedded in them and with experiential learning, mostly service learning. Lots of other examples here. Um, I'll just say uh, Michigan State University, I think, is a leader in really organizing their general education program in a very international way, and again, all around big problems. Uh, not just knowledge areas, but big thematic pathways through general education. That's also how there's some experiments at the Cal State system in a two-year, four-year transfer project in which t they start their general education program at the two-year institution, but it's organized around a theme. Think public health, justice, sustainability, um, global affairs, things like that. They're getting their gen ed requirements, but they're doing it in a thematic way, and when they get to the four-year institution, when they do upper division general education, if they stick with the theme, they can also get a minor and a certificate in whatever that theme is. So it's a different way of not sacrificing breadth, but organizing the pathway through the knowledge that students need. So I will end with another quote from College Learning for the New Global Century. Because really this both and vision is because we have higher aspirations for our students than just getting them jobs, right? We want to graduate the next generation of leaders, the next generation of citizens, who are not just following rules, who are not just doing what needs to get done, but are asking really tough questions about the kind of society we are, the kind of society we want to be, the kind of jobs we want to create, and are not just saying, well, how do I get this job done because you've asked me to do it, but what is most worth doing? And you're going to be educating the next generation of entrepreneurs who are going to invent a whole lot of industries and jobs that don't even exist yet. And if we're going to prepare them, that's why we need this both and vision. So thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Deborah, thank you for that phenomenal message and the very compelling case of that both and vision. We have t a little time for a few questions. Uh, if you want to make your way to the microphone while we're doing that, um, we just want to thank you from the planning committee. My name is, as you know, Nathan Lindsay and Rebecca Power. Many, many they're people. The, they're the brains behind the uh, whole thing. Yeah. But, no, but, really they are. <laughs> many, many people have worked on this, and we, we want to thank you for coming, and we have a gift oh, of appreciation. <laughs> thank you so much. So, thank you. We have a question. <laughs> I can hear you. That's okay. I can repeat it if people can't hear it. Well, I have two questions. Uh, the first is actually just a curiosity. So with the data, yes. I'd be curious if uh, in a future survey they were required to rank those. those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rank the... Instead of saying, is this very important, less important, whatever, say, because it's really a zero-sum game because they're... How much can you do? Yeah, yeah. Can you rank these skills in the order that are, they're important to you? And that would be very interesting. Yeah, that is an interesting different way of doing it. We've asked it a couple different ways. We've asked, um, do, you, do you think we should be paying more attention, less, or the same to each one? This time we said, well, how important is it? Rank it uh, 0 to 10. So what I was showing you were the percentage. So in some ways, we were, we were in a backhanded way, eliciting what rises to the top. Um, I, I would venture to say, since I've talked to a lot of these people, that 
I can assure you the ones that would come out on the top would be critical thinking, analytic reasoning, and communication. Um, and then hands-on, mm, real-world experience. By far, those were the things that mm, always come out on top. Mm. And I, I expect the same as well, which feeds into my second question slash comment, which is, in these slides, what jumps out to me as one partial solution to improving these things is an integration of technology and I don't mean that in terms of using, you know, overheads and slides. I mean right. in terms of uh, providing students with technological skills in the these fields that we've been talking yep. about. Yep. And and that wasn't uh, present in the slides. And I'll, I'll make a comment on this. So, what what I've seen, and I'm I'm totally biased. I'm a computer science professor. So <laughs> you can just full disclosure up front. But uh, what I've seen in terms of students that we have and students that come back to us from other majors or from the community is that, um, you know, for example, I get emails all the time, we do, from students in other majors who have gone through their whole undergraduate program and they're still uh, technically illiterate in terms yep. of um, interpreting data, yep. in terms of automating their analyses for things, and uh, they don't realize this until they start doing research at the master's level. Absolutely. And then they come to us and say, well, what's the quickest route that I can go through to do what you guys do without... Give me the boot camp on the side. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that's really difficult. And, and when I think <coughs> historically to what a liberal education means, it means being well-rounded and having the tools to succeed as you presented in any... Including the technology tools. So mm -hmm. Yep radical way that we can become competitive nationally in this arena or continue to be if we already are is by starting a discussion about making technology part of a general education because if we're not already there we're back and we're quickly approaching the point where contributions both in a field and vocationally are limited by technological Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So three, three quick comments on that. Um, one is to use myself as an example. So, so I went to college a very long time ago, uh, and I had one of those general education programs that had barely any requirements at all, like mm, two of these and two of those and two of those. And boy, I was one of those people who, I was a humanities person, and I had done reasonably well in school, so they said, oh, well, your science math thing, right, take the next calculus, cl multivariate calculus, that'll satisfy that. I managed to sort of squeak my way through it, became an art history major, tried to stay away from numbers from that, numbers and technology from that point on. It would have been really, so now I do a job, mm -mm right, <laughs> where I'm dealing with numbers all the time. I'm dealing with analyzing these and, and crafting these kinds of surveys. Somebody could have told me that, you know what, instead of that multivariate calculus thing, you might have done a stats course. And I think the same kind of message to our humanities uh, majors now, big data matters and technology matters, not just um, in a sort of simplistic way, but how do we function in this technology-rich world? Absolutely. How do we, how do, we do that? Um, ACNU is about to release a paper in January called The Digital Opportunity for Liberal Learning, um, and it is trying to get at this new, entirely new ecosystem of learning and technology and, and how we leverage it for the kinds of outcomes that we're talking about. So stay tuned. We'll have more on that. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Is this one? Yeah, yeah, it's working. It is working, but I can speak very loudly, so I'm just gonna no. Use the mic. Use the mic because I think they're taping, right? <laughs> okay, forgive me. Um, my question focuses on structure, mm -hmm. and that was um, many of the things that you commented to resonate and connected with me. I'm, I'm sure it did everyone in this room. Yet there are still so many impediments on a structural basis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at the forefront of my mind, I'm thinking of some of the connections to, you know, the Iron Triangle and Viberian notions, Viberian notions of bureaucracy, that when do we, yep. when do we, when are we able to take that next step to engage with that? And, and at the end, you spoke to many of those examples of schools that are transforming education, yet when we look at the daily steps that we need to take, it seems insurmountable given yeah. the existing framework and structures we have in place. How do we move beyond that? Yeah, no, it's, it's, the, it's probably the most important question. I mean, I think that we are in a moment where our, we have legacy structures within our institutions and across higher education that really we all know are not fully aligned with the kind of education we're trying to provide. But the, one of the things about, you know, there's, I, I sometimes in, I'm in worlds 
the sort of dip, di uh, uh, disruptive innovation world, right, where they're going to completely build a whole new version of us outside of us, right, and it's going to be so much better. I'm a little skeptical. Um, and one of the things that, that I always say is we have to build the innovation and, and leverage the innovation that is already happening on your campus. So it was mentioned before, I'm sure there are radically interesting innovation, innovative integrative designs already on this campus. And the question for your leaders, right, is how do you break down the structures of, that are preventing that innovation from becoming mainstream, right? And it's, it is absolutely hard. We have de departments for a reason. <laughs> We're also um, a conservative, the academy is conservative with a small c also for a reason. That's why it's been around for I don't know, thousands of years. That's not a bad thing necessarily, right? So it's definitely a balancing act between not wanting to move too quickly and now, of course, being pressured to move very, very quickly. And so the really good leaders, you have one of them, are thinking of how we can do that by building on your strengths. And I do think that a research university in a city with, with lots of good partnerships is ideally suited to do it because you have all the right ingredients. You also, though, have the, the disadvantage of being a big bureaucracy because you're a big place, right? I mean, you're a big institution and you have to divide the labor up in some way, and so you do. But I guess I would just encourage as much opening of doors and windows from one department to another as possible. Um, and for your leadership to do as much rewarding of that as possible, that's sometimes our reward system, sometimes don't reward that, don't reward risk taking, don't reward innovation, don't reward attention to teaching. <laughs> um, and that all has to happen for an institution to do what I've been talking about. Um, but I, it's hard, so. <laughs> We're a few minutes over time. Um, the good news is that she will be here all day, so you can ask your question uh, during the day. And Ryder's question of how do we do this is going to be answered in the next panel and in our breakout sessions. So please make your way, if you can, to the UC ballroom, the North Ballroom. And please join me again in giving Deborah a round of applause. <laughs>